I will start by <coughs> reading some uh, short uh, uh, abstracts from an important leaflet. was distributed in the Fiat plant in May 69, that is uh, just before the hot autumn. When uh, we had uh, what we can call a prelude, or the first shots of that movement. The, the leaflet was signed by the first elected shop stewards inside the Fiat plant. They, they, were, they were elected uh, uh, not by all the workers, only in, in one part of the factory, in one particular shop, and they were appealing to all the, uh, their comrades to do the same and to organize the, the factory council in Fiat. It, it goes, uh, comrades of the Fiat and uh, workers' delegates. These days we are witnessing uh, uh, events of enormous importance. The strength of the company of Fiat has been shattered by the workers' uh, struggle. And the iron laws of productions have been uh, upset by the strength of the workers, which in, uh, in these days have been freed through the strikes, unleashed, if you like, through the strikes. By uh, the internal meetings and assemblies of the workers inside the factory. and uh, by the uh, election of uh, delegates representing uh, each different group of workers. And then it goes ex on explaining how workers' democracy sh should and could be organized inside the factory. And its aims. It says uh, in every uh, part of the factory, in every shift, in every team of the workers, we must organize the meeting and elect the shop stewards. Using the strength of the strike to complete change our uh, conditions at work and uh, uh, by um, implementing workers' control. The workers' assembly must uh, elect the delegate, the shop steward, and, and is able to recall him at every time. He must be uh, the most conscious uh, worker in his uh, group, and he must be entrusted by all, the, by, by all his workmates. is not uh, nominated by any organization outside the factory, but uh, it must be uh, the direct expression of the will of the uh, workers' assembly, or the workers' meeting. And therefore, he is accountable only towards the workers and nobody else. And then uh, they propose five uh, points, five demands on the question of workers' control. First point is that any uh, moving of uh, shifting of workers from one place or another in the, or, or the factory can be uh, stopped, can be uh, blocked if the uh, shop stewards is against it. Uh, 
any change in shifts, any request for overtime work must be approved by the workers, uh, by the shop stewards, and uh, he has the power to stop it. Any um, initiative by the uh, uh, factory management regarding uh, wage increases and uh, other, uh, um, 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 yes, wage increases mainly and the uh, different elements of the pay the, the workers get can be uh, suspended, can be stopped by the shop stewards, which will uh, remit any decision to the workers' meeting. And uh, the, the fourth point was very important. It said uh, uh, the workers' meeting, and uh, only, the, only it, uh, is uh, entitled to discuss and to decide uh, about uh, um, the conditions of work, the um, um, unhealthy working uh, uh, conditions, and uh, it must uh, uh, put forward proposals to slow down the rhythm of the, on the assembly line. To, to, to have uh, more uh, rest uh, periods during the shift, more pauses. And, and also to, to propose uh, uh, changes in, in the uh, physical conditions of work in order to fight unhealthy uh, situations. And the workers' meeting through the shop stewards must control uh, peace work. Peace work is when uh, was when part of the pay was not uh, was not guaranteed, but was uh, uh, related to the number of pieces you actually produced during the shift with different targets to reach. <laughs> so these uh, these words uh, brings us straight to one of the key points of those events. That is the rebirth of the uh, workers' democracy and the workers' councils in the, all the Italian factories, re, uh, giving new life to an old tradition going back to the 1999-1920 years. And it, it, it was the, the, the proof that the movement was going far beyond the organized uh, layers in the trade unions and was, uh, uh, had, had the need to have more flexible, more wide forms of organization in order to uh, uh, organize, to encompass all the uh, mass of the workers who had been passive until that point. At, at the highest point in the uh, autumn of 69, the movement reached about 8 million workers in all the different industries. 8 million. Ocho. Ocho. During the months between September and December 1969. And in that movement, historical uh, victories were gained. The 
40 hours a week. The abolition of uh, the different treatment uh, between uh, white collars and blue collars in industry. The abolition of what they were called the uh, wage cage, that is a, uh, a norm that said that in the southern regions, wages were legally 30% lower than in the, in the rest of the country. The labor code, which was approved immediately after that movement, was a, a, an historical uh, a ground stone for the Italian workers' movement, like a, like a cornerstone upon which it built its struggle for 30 years. <coughs> in the labor code approved in, in May 1970, immediately after the hot autumn, it was uh, the, 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 the law recognized uh, the right uh, of uh, elect shop stewards. The right uh, to have uh, uh, free meetings inside the workplaces. the end of all uh, discrimination and victimization on basis of trade union activities. And many other uh, uh, victories who were won in the following years up, to, up until 1975. In 75, the Italian workers won the real uh, sliding scale of wages. which meant that every three months wage, uh, wages were uh, automatically uh, increased according to the real inflation. But important as they were, these uh, victories and these conquests, they were only uh, a byproduct of the movement. They were the byproduct of a movement uh, uh, which went far beyond these demands, in a sense, it's in its uh, aims. When on uh, the 3rd of July 1979, there was uh, the first uh, demonstration coming out of the Fiat plant in Turin, And they clashed with the police, which attacked them very, very heavily. The slogan that the workers, and particularly the young workers of, the, of a new immigration for, from southern Italy shouted was, we want everything, vogliamo tutto. So we know that the uh, revolution has got its laws, and we must know these laws. <coughs> but this does not mean that, that every revolution is equal to every, every, any other revolution. On the contrary, we must uh, be able to understand the internal logic, the inner logic of uh, uh, the given process in order to gain the method. May 68 in France, for instance, was a, a, a concentrated explosion. All the strength of, of the movement came out in the, those six weeks of struggles. And the workers, in a very, very short space of time, reached the highest uh, forms of mobilization, that is the all-out all strikes and factory occupations. 
According to the tradition of the French workers' movement, like in June 36, But the, 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 the movement in Italy, which was a part of the same process, took a, a partially different form. Because uh, uh, it, it, it was certainly a, a big explosion in 69, as I will uh, explain later on. But in reality, it, op it opened uh, a, a pre-revolutionary situation which lasted uh, with different stages until the end of the 70s. So more than a decade, more than a decade in which in s at several points the working class could have uh, uh, opened a, a direct struggle for power. So, so I think that the meaning of the discussion like this is not just to try to, to know more about the history of the workers' movement in this or, or in that country. But to try to, to gain this method for having what Lenin called the concrete analysis of a concrete given uh, situation, which is the method which we will have to apply in the future. Now, the background to the hot autumn uh, is, uh, first of all, a story of a, a deep uh, separation, of a deep gap opening between the working class and its organizations. The 50s were, uh, had been a, a decade of defeats. After 1948, there was a widespread uh, purge in all the workplaces in Italy. And uh, a complete change and renewal of the working class itself. During the, uh, during the so-called economic miracle, that is between uh, 55, let's say, to 65, something like 10 to 15 million people moved away from their homes, emigrating. Mainly from, the south, mainly from the south to the northern Italy, but also from the countryside to the cities and even abroad, of course. And uh, the Communist Party and the uh, CGIL, which was the main trade union, still retained their uh, hegemony in the, in the, work, in the uh, workers, working class, but they were very far removed from these new layers of workers. I will give uh, only one figure, a couple of figures to show this. In 1949, in Fiat, in Turin, out of, out of a workers, workforce of 42,000 workers, the FIOM, that is a metal workers union of the CGIL, had 37,500 members. That is 80 or 90 percent, 37,500. No, 
In uh, 1967, out of a workers' force of uh, about 50,000 in Mirafiori alone, the FIOM had only 1,000 members. And the, the, the so-called internal commissions, which, uh, which was the only recognized trade union body inside the fact, factory, was composed only by 18 workers in this gigantic plant. Commission interna. And uh, the, the, only, the only unions which were allowed to free or speak to the workers were the Catholic Union, the CISL or FIM in the metal workers. And the yellow union organized by Fiat itself, which still exists. Well, Fiat was probably a, a, a high point in this process. But it was also the leading force in the Italian uh, bourgeoisie, like, like today. It, <coughs> as far as the Communist Party is concerned, Uh, during all those uh, 15 uh, or 20 years, it saw a decline in its uh, um, working class base. The number of workers inside the party proportionally de decreased by far. The 20 years before. The, and the membership in general also declined, particularly in the big towns. In, in 1970, the Giuliano Paietta, who was uh, in charge of the, um, sorry, he was uh, uh, the leader of the Communist Party, who had, who was um, in charge for the. Um, factory branches and cells, that is, all the organized work uh, in the workplaces by the Communist Party said the following words. He said, in previous years, in most of the Italian factories, the party didn't have a real organization, real party organization, and, and sometimes not even a, an organized small nucleus of communists able to take political initiative. The cadres uh, of, the, of the trade union were mainly made by people who were uh, politicized 20 years before in the resistance movement. But they, they had been they had been expel, evicted and expelled from, from the factories by repression. And most of them were certainly honorable fighters and had a glorious past. But in 20 years they get uh, accustomed to defeats. And so they had they, their uh, political view, their psychology, their attitude was uh, shaped by those years. And, and these conditions gave the bosses for 15 years almost a free hand in the workplaces. There was a... Uh, a real counter-revolution in the workplaces, an almost increases in productivity, mm -hmm. 
intolerable conditions as far as health, the pace of work, the rhythm of work is concerned. Which were imposed upon a new working class who in, a, in, a, in its main part uh, had no traditions from the past. And it was not, not only the exploitation in the workplace. Because particularly the uh, immigrant working class from the south Although being formally citizens of the same republic of the other workers, suffered also serious uh, discrimination and racism in society in general. It was, it was not uh, uh, an uncommon thing to, to see, for instance, a placard, uh, we don't rent uh, rooms to southerners. and things like that. So the, the first element was this uh, separ the very deep separation of the, this deep gap between the class and its organized uh, expressions. Another important element was the students' movement in 68. Uh, starting from 1976, the Italian students, first in universities and then in, in the schools. 66, yes. Fernand, Fred is correcting me. In Trento is 66. <laughs> and interesting is to note that uh, uh, some of the first uh, uh, how do you say, the um, breeding grounds for the student movement were the elite Catholic universities. Uh, which were uh, created by the Christian democracy, allegedly, to create the new ruling class. In the Catholic University of Milan, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't uh, enter without a, a letter from the priest of your country or of your uh, neighborhood. And, uh, and nevertheless, the, the, the students' movement played an important role. And there is, a, there is also another analogy with, with today, because it is quite clear that an important part of the radicalization of the students was the, was the international uh, landscape, if you like. The Cuban Revolution, the Vietnam War, Palestinian Liberation Movement, uh, the movement in, un in the United States, and, 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 and so on. And uh, the students' movement in reality, I, well, I, I don't have enough time to deal it properly, we, although it's very interesting. After, uh, after its first uh, uh, explosion in uh, the spring of 68, was quite in a crisis. They had no real idea of where to go. And the, the ideology was, uh, of course, very confused, uh, w ranging from the idea of a student's power to guerrillaism and many other ideas. But it was precisely at this point, that is between uh, the summer of 68 and the summer of 69, 
that the first shots uh, of the working class uh, struggles are, uh, are being fired. And this gave the students, or the more, more active layer, a natural point of reference to continue their struggle. And they, they began to orientate themselves toward these factories. Uh, there are uh, quite several dozens of examples uh, which we can give, maybe 100. But I, I will deal only with some of them. But first of all, another important episode which is worth quoting. It also proves another point that we spoke about uh, two days ago. That is the fact that uh, quite often the first to move are not the traditional heavy battalions of the class, but the unorganized, the backward, uh, politically backward uh, layers of the working class. <coughs> there was an important textile factory in Valdagno, which is in the region of Venice, in Veneto. Very, at that time, a very uh, quite conservative and Catholic area of the country, still is. And uh, in, this, uh, in this plant, in this plant, uh, there have been no class struggles for one century and a half. It was a whole community, the, 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 the village or the, or, the, or the small town and the factory, which uh, since 1836 have been living under the idea of uh, class collaboration and of the and uh, we uh, under of course the vigilance of uh, the Holy Mother, the Church. But at a certain point in the spring of 68, the, there is a restructuring of the textile sector. And the bosses increase uh, the rhythm on the, in the factory and then they declare 400 redundancies. And then all of a sudden, uh, there was an explosion. And after a demonstration of 4,000 workers, they went to the, to the, the main square the, of, of the town, where there was a statue. And the statue was the statue of Count Marzotto, who founded the factory. and they tear it down. So this uh, uh, is a, a symbolic episode which shows the end of uh, class collaboration, if you like. And shows also an important uh, process, which was the radicalization in a part of the uh, rank and file of the Catholic organizations. The Association of Christian Workers, ACLI, in the 40s has been one of the main tools for uh, the struggle against the Communist Party set up by the Christian Democracy. It was spearheading the, the, the fight against the Communist Party influence in, in the working class. But on the basis of the process I've outlined before, the change in the condition, the worsening condition, and the radicalization which was going un underground, under the surface, these organizations were also affected. And it is not strange, strange that part 
of the cadres of the revolutionary left organization and of the trade union left in the following years came from the Catholic organizations. So when in uh, summer 68, 60, uh, beginning of 69, the students began, began to go to the factory, they found themselves in a, a very interesting position. Because uh, these uh, big plants were beginning to boil. But the trade union bureaucracy was still very looking uh, another, in another direction. They were not prepared to give any lead or any organization to these early movements. The, the, the bureaucracy was still linked to, to, the, to the previous stage of uh, defeats, and therefore they accepted the idea of uh, uh, that um, uh, there were periods of uh, the, they called trade union truce, where you cannot strike. And, uh, and therefore, these small groups, we are talking about a few hundreds, maybe a couple of thousands uh, of youth in, in different orga organizations, found uh, an open space and, uh, and a direct link, not to the working class in general, but to some of its uh, vanguard sectors. And so in some of the most important factories, like Pirelli in Milan, The chemical, uh, the chemical industry is just outside Venice. Uh, Fiat came a little bit later, but also Fiat in Turin. But several others. We had this uh, merging of a students activist and a section of uh, radicalized young workers. And uh, these, uh, these sections began to elaborate demands and to organize strikes. And it was a very elemental form of organization. They called themselves, uh, like for instance, uh, the Students' Workers' uh, Assembly meeting. or the rank and file committee of Pirelli, the unified rank and file committee. Or in Turin, they just signed their leaflets, the struggle goes on, workers and students. And, uh, and these advanced workers, which in part were also members of the rank and file members of the Communist Party, of the CGIL, of the uh, SIUP, they were not only new people. Nothing comes from nothing. There, there is always a, a link which can be traced back. Began to organize struggles uh, on the issues, uh, on the most immediate and concrete issues that workers were facing. And they were uh, isolated and furiously attacked by the bureaucracy. But given this combination of, uh, of situation, they, they, they were able, able to lead, actually, not the, the movement in general, but it's, uh, the, it's uh, first line, if you like. Okay. And the, the, uh, one of the leaders of the FIOM, Garavini, who later was also a general secretary of FIOM, I think, and, and later on also the Refondazione, he said that in the summer of 1969, we didn't control fiat. 
they did. The, the so-called grouplets, they did. Now, let me say this. The economic conditions are very different today, of course. And there are many differences. But just think about what is happening on in Italy today. What's going on? The, uh, nobody is going to, to the factories. The trade union bureaucracy is at its lowest level of authority. And the, and the bosses are trying to eliminate and to eradicate the metal workers union, the FIOM, from the workplaces. And precisely in the same way it, it happened 40 years ago, they are these days finding out that you cannot control a big workplace or in general the working class only by using yellow union and, and, uh, and uh, uh, yes, yellow unions and scabs union, if you like. And the, and the points of support they, they thought they had are, clam are crumbling. And now everywhere they go, these uh, the fake trade unionists paid by fiat in the fiat plants are being attacked by the workers. And uh, I repeat here what we said in, in our meeting in Italy a few weeks ago. Those revolutionary students and youth and young workers in 1968-69 were able to connect and to link with the vanguard of the working class bypassing the bureaucracy who was caught wrong-footed was displaced, was, uh, was not prepared to. And uh, and they were able to build sizable organizations, big organizations. Now, in the, for, for almost one year, in, in, in these uh, this factories, there is a, so, what, what they call a trade union guerrilla, or industrial guerrilla, if you like. The, the workers uh, uh, display uh, an enormous amount of uh, creativity and you know, of uh, imagination, also all forms of uh, struggles uh, of a strike are uh, experimented. Internal demonstration inside the factory to chase after the, the scabs, of course, wildcat strike. Wildcat strikes, with no warning. Uh, well, uh, what you could go call uh, stop and go strikes. We st strike one hour, then work another hour, then stop, uh, strike again. <laughs> or the the chessboard struggle. <laughs> what is a chessboard struggle? You don't stop all the factory. We stop you. you you stop one part, one plant, or one shop, and then the other one, and then another one. So many ways for causing the maximum dis disruption of production with the minimum effort. Slowdowns, even sabotage sometimes. And, uh, and the bosses were forced to begin to, to, to make some concessions. And it is precisely in this uh, uh, beginning of the, of the rising tide that the question of a factory council and of shop stewards comes, comes to the fore. Why? Well, in general, 
workers' councils or Soviets are an indication that the movement is reaching the, to, the, the, all the class, all the layers of the class. And in that particular conditions, the trade union leadership was not prepared to give a lead. And uh, the, the, the leaders of these struggles, these committees, these rank and file committees, were small groups with no organization, very informal, very flexible, but also very primitive, if you like. And as the movement began to encompass wider and wider layer, layer of workers, they needed some form of, of, of organization. And this took the form of the factory councils, electing sh shops towards in every workplace, in every uh, part of the workplace. Just to give you an idea, as I said before, before in, in 1967 or 68, before the movement, in Fiat, in, in, in the main plant, uh, Fiat has many plants, they had, uh, the trade union has a representation committee of only 18 members in a factory of 50,000. After the movement, the Fiat management had to recognize 800 different shop stewards from all the plant, or every team elected his own shop stewards, and then on the line and on different levels. It was called the, the Consiglione, the big council of Mirafiori, which was a, 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 a key working class body until 1980, when it was destroyed by the defeat. That's another discussion. And uh, after these uh, cracks begin to open, uh, after a, a year or so, the trade union bureaucracy begin, begins to realize what is going on. Or rather, or rather they understand that they cannot just uh, oppose this movement, that if they, they continue with their previous position, they will lose control in the main factory of, of the country. And this is another very important point. Because in the summer of 69, both the CGIL, but particularly the, the, the Metal Workers Union, decided a tactical turn, if you like, a partial turn, in order to accept some of the demands coming up from the factories. Uh, the, the main uh, maneuver is, is this. We accept to break the, the truce, if you like, we had with the bosses, and we accept uh, some of the most radical demands coming from the workplaces. We accept also to recognize the, the delegates, which were war they, they were uh, furiously op opposing up, up until the point. But this will be only at workplace level. Only at the workplace level. That is, no coordination, no links of these bodies at the highest level. And uh, you, will, you will decide inside the plant. You will lead a struggle inside the plant. You, you will have workers' democracy inside the plant, but not outside. But, uh, and here we see the, the, the great mistakes, one of the great uh, dramatic mistakes of the so-called revolutionary left. Because uh, they thought that the, what they have been witnessing and experiencing up, to, up, to, up till that point was going on forever. And so they said, no, the shop stewards proposed by the bureaucracy are a trap. Um, the, we, uh, the, the, only, the only organization we need is just a committee and demonstrations. And behind this, uh, uh, this uh, 
I, this uh, attitude there was the idea that uh, of the so-called uh, permanent offensive the trade unions are just uh, organs of the capitalist state and so they they couldn't understand that uh, it was not uh, the same thing to reach a vanguard which, was, which had already reached the revolutionary conclusions, if you like. And it was not the same thing to approach a, a million which was clearly preparing, a movement which was clearly preparing of millions. With, with different levels of experience, different levels of consciousness. And so that was the beginning of the crisis of the revolutionary left, particularly in the big factories. They were not able to, they, they lost the hegemony they had won in the previous months. But at the same time, the, the, this turn of the CGIL or the FIOM meant a, an, an enormous uh, generalization of the movement. And so from September on, the movement is no longer a movement of uh, small uh, vanguards uh, of, uh, or of, uh, as they say, the, uh, 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 well, I don't know what they say, of a single workplace, important as they were, but it, it becomes a general movement of the class. It is metal workers, chemical workers, uh, land laborers, teachers, textile, construction workers, every section of the working class began to enter this movement. And uh, this, is the, this is the real high tide between sep uh, September and October. Every day, every day, general strikes of this or that industry, general strike of this or that town, mass demonstrations. And uh, as the bosses tried to resist for the first time, the metal workers, I think it was the 28th of, no of November, organized the, the, the first national march in Rome. Which was, it, it was the first time. And uh, uh, all the methods I spoke about, uh, different methods of strikes, uh, of struggle were, uh, were employed. There was a complete drop in production in all the sectors, and particularly those sectors which had been in the forefront of the economic uh, boom. Uh, industries, not only the car industries, factories producing uh, refrigerators, washing machines, and all the, all the products which were typical of the, of the post-war boom. Three hundred million hours lost in strikes, and uh, as I said, it was not just a trade union struggle. Although the trade union bureaucracy was able to regain control, as I said, because the idea was we are winning control in the workplace. We will have uh, more equality in the workplaces, better conditions, and workers' control. And from that, we will be able to do the same in, the, in society as a whole. That was the main driving force. And so after trying to resist, the, the bosses had to, on one side, uh, uh, accept and uh, uh, accept the main demands of the movement. And on the other hand, they uh, also began to, to threaten and to try to terrorize and to crush this movement. The two uh, tools went uh, together. 
And so on the, on the, on the 12th of December of 1969, there is a whole series of uh, attempts of uh, bomb attacks were organized by the fascists. Fascist organization led by the secret services, both Italian and American. And the, the most important, the most important was the uh, bomb blast in Milan in, the, in one bank, which killed uh, 12 people. And, and all the, the, the media, the papers, the TV channels of the ruling class began, began a Red Scare campaign, blaming the, the, the troubles, the strikes, the social disorder. The, and they said that the, 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 the attack was made by the anarchist uh, uh, elements. We must bring order back in society. And uh, we must remember that the example of, the, of, Greek, uh, of Greece was very close in time. The, 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 and the, and the, the regime of the, uh, the military regime was still in power. It was not really that they were going to uh, coup d'etat. This was not the main idea of the ruling class. But they unleashed these elements, the far right, the, the fascists, the, and these provocations, in order to cow the, particularly the trade union bureaucracy and the leaders of the left, and to, to scare them and to make them uh, uh, try to pacify society and the movement. But it was quite clear that the working class was not uh, scared by this. When the, when the funerals of the victims of this attempt in Milan was, were held a few days later, as I said, there were attempts to organize some sort of red scare campaign of, uh, you know, uh, But you can say that practically all the workers of Milan were in the square organized by the unions, by the left wing parties, and so on, as to witness, as a way of saying, we will not let you go this road. We, will, we are occupying this space. You cannot go this way. And so the hot autumn ended those in, in around those days with a 81 new uh, national uh, um, uh, collective uh, agreements in different industries. 81, 81 contracts in national category. And uh, with uh, more or less, uh, uh, we're all in the same uh, line, as I said in the beginning, that is, uh, The big uh, uh, wage increases, significant wage increases, the reduction of the work, uh, working week from 44 to 40 hours, and, uh, and so on. And, and particularly this question of the right to have the unions and the workers' organization inside the workplace. And, uh, uh, the, the labor code uh, approved in uh, 1970 said in every workplace you could have uh, 10 hours per year of uh, free meeting paid by the by the by the company, and and the, and the union can organize this. Free access of the unions to the workplace, freedom of movement for the, inside the workplace for the shop stewards in order to control what's going on and to speak to the workers. This, uh, uh, this is what the, 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 the so-called revolutionary left, left could not understand. The, the same trade union leaders, this is quite funny or quite uh, bitter, if you like, 
the same trade union leader of the FIOM who were taken by the workers and, and by force uh, taken inside the factory to, help, to hold meetings. Well, the same that uh, 20 or, uh, yes, more or less 20 years later, sold out the main, uh, the main uh, victories of that movement. The role of the bureaucracy is not always the same. Or rather, it is always the same, but the form it takes and the way it acts is different given to, accord to, to different concrete and material conditions. And so the, the, the result of the movement was an enormous increase in, in, tra in trade union uh, affiliation, which went up until 77. And also a renewal in the Communist Party, which was a mass working class party at that time. In 1970, a few months later, the Communist Party was able to hold a national conference of uh, factory branches and nucleus cells. And in this conference were present more than 6,000 workers. <coughs> elected by more than 2,000 party branches in workplaces and factories. So it was quite clear that from uh, after that, that movement, the struggle for uh, revolutionary ideas could not go on in the same way as it went before. It was necessary to challenge openly this bureaucracy, with this, uh, these uh, leaders who were clearly able to regain their control of the movement on the basis of the hopes raised by the movement itself. But this was never understood by any of these groups. And uh, the, the, the ruling class took more than one decade to close this uh, uh, revolutionary opportunity. It took more than one decade for the ruling class to close this uh, epoch of revolution. Decade. Yes, 12 years actually. And the main tool they, they used was precisely the trade union and the Communist Party leadership, particularly the Communist Party. The effect, uh, the, the effect of, the, of the mass movement was only to uh, inflate and to uh, the, the vote for the Communist Party and left uh, parties in general. Up until 1975-76, when the Communist Party reached its peak with uh, 12 million votes, 35 percent. And uh, of, of course, the vanguard, or we knew what, not, not we physically. <laughs> uh, as a Marxist, we know the, the role that these people were, were going to play. But for the mass of the workers, when the Communist Party leaders say, now we're going to have big reforms to generalize these victories in all aspects of life, they, they were hearing the word reform, but it was like saying change in society, revolution. Also because up until 1975, the ruling class was, was forced and compelled to give actual reforms. In 
in education, in uh, health. The right to divorce was uh, successfully defended in 1974. Divorzio. <coughs> Uh, the right of abortion was uh, won in 1978, and many, and many other uh, reforms. So there was a feeling of, of advancing, that uh, one push after another, we will get there. And so the only, the, and it was impossible to, uh, to face this just with the repression. The neo-fascists were used, uh, yes, they, they, they were used heavily to attack uh, left-wing um, activists, uh, trade unionists, and so on. But they were not a real force who could uh, contend for power. And the idea of a right-wing coup by the army or the state apparatus was present. There were conspiracies, like the Gladio conspiracy and many others. There were even some attempts, ill-fated attempts, of trying to start a process towards a coup. But this was, this was not really representing the, the real uh, uh, idea of the main sectors of, of, the, of the ruling class, because they knew that uh, if they had tried to confront this movement and these uh, organizations uh, only by force, victory was uh, certainly not uh, certain for them. On the contrary. And this was another of the big mistakes of, of the left-wing organizations, the revolutionary left, I mean, but also the bureaucracy, who played with this idea. No. Uh, we are in danger of fascism. There is a danger of a reaction. And some parts of the revolutionary organizations also toyed with this idea, played with this idea, thinking that it was a way of, uh, you know, reawakening the rank and file of the Communist Party. You know, if there is a danger of open reaction, they will fight like in the 40s against uh, the Nazis. Very, very simplistic approach, if you like. But the only way to do this was uh, to, 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 to defeat the movement was to involve the, tra the Communist Party bureaucracy, and so they did. And so in 1973, just after, after the coup in, in Chile, uh, the, the coup d'etat which uh, killed uh, Allende and uh, opened the era of uh, Pinochet dictatorship. The general secretary of the Communist Party, Berlinguer, wrote uh, this, uh, laid the ground for a new line, if you like, which was not new at all. He said, uh, uh, looking at Chile and uh, how it tended the, the popular uh, unity government, the left-wing government, the, conclu the conclusion we must draw is that it's not enough to win a parliamentary majority of the left forces, that is, the socialist and the communist parties. It's not enough to have 51% in the elections. And they also, also of, of course, gave a, a, a very principled argument. We are not parliamentary cretinists. <laughs> we, we, are not, we, are, we are not the fetish of democracy. <laughs> and therefore, in order to change uh, society and to avoid the risk of reaction, we need an agreement of what they call the main popular forces in Italy, that is the Communist Party and the Christian Democracy.
the so-called uh, historical compromise, as they called it, which was nothing new in reality because it was the same policy of the 40s. And, and uh, on this position, they, they went on to the election of 75, which are regional elections, and then 76. And, uh, uh, and when in 76, there was, a, the fi the, 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 if you like, a, the, the highest point of confrontation on, on the electoral plane, there was a complete polarization of the vote. All the forces of the ruling class rallied around the Christian democracy. All the, all the other bu minor bourgeois parties were completely uh, sucked in by this uh, concentration of the forces of, of reaction, actually. And all the forces of the left of the working class rallied around the, the, the Communist Party. The, 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 the far left, the revolutionary left, tried to stand in, in those elections under the... To stand, no, no, to stand. And uh, they were an uh, important organization. I think that uh, in the overall figure, maybe, there were 30,000 members, active people, maybe, at the highest point. Let's say, let's say this, Workers Vanguard reached 8,000. And it was formed by starting by a small nucleus of less than 100 in 68. <laughs> who were with the Mandalites and were leading a, a deep entryism in the Communist Party. And, and when this failed, they saw the movement outside, they left. They broke with the Mandalites and they set up a new organization, which grew up, uh, up to around 8,000 8, uh, members with a certain influence in the, in the factories, particularly in Milan and, and, and the Long. And uh, Lotta Continua also had a similar process in, uh, in Turin, mainly, but then it became a national organization. It was the biggest. And the cadres who started this organization came precisely from uh, a lost battle, if you like, inside the Communist Party, the PSUP, which was a left-wing socialist party in the 60s. And I think that uh, Lotta Continua also reached about 10,000 members at, at this size. And then there were many others, smaller groups. So the, it was a quite an important force, which was uh, uh, present in society, in the schools, and so on. And they, did, they tried to stand in this election in 76. And they were, they were expecting three million votes. But since the working class was thinking that this was one decisive battle, you know, we, we, we must uh, end the war by electing uh, the Communist Party to the government, they only got 600,000 votes and they elected nobody. And this was the beginning of the end for these forces, of course. And, uh, but even, even, even after those elections, where there were two winners, if you like, because the Christian democracy were able to rally all the layers who were afraid you know, of the Communist Party going into the government. And so they were forced to an agreement between the Communist Party and the Christian democracy to form a government. Actually, the ruling class could not rule Italy at that time without the Communist Party. That was the point. 
The Communist Party was not allowed to enter the government. They, they, they just gave uh, support in the parliament, which was even worse, if you like. But even that was not enough. They had to draw in the trade union bureaucracy. And so in 1977, the CGIL began to withdraw, to, to backtrack. There was the, the CGIL, the trade union, 77. There was the economic crisis, Inflation at 20%, unemployment beginning to grow, international uh, tensions, corruption, chaos, everything, terrorism. And so they said, uh, that the leaders of the, of the CJL said, uh, we understand that in this condition we must ask the workers for a substantial and real sacrifice to, to, make, to take their share of the burden. Always the same, the same thing. Sacrifices for all. We sacrifice today for a better future. And uh, so they began to, uh, you know, to backtrack, to, to go. After eight years of advance, they began to retreat. And it was not, not so easy because the working class still felt strong. They had felt a, a taste of power, if you like, of their own force. In 1978, it was still enough to bring a, a national demonstration of, uh, of the metal workers to tear down a government. I think it was in February 78. I'm not sure of the month. And so in the end, they, they understood that they had to destroy the, the power of the working class where it laid, that is, in the workplaces, to destroy the working class organization in the factory and to regain control. And that was the meaning of the, of the, of the, 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 the last, if you like, the last big uh, battle of the hot autumn, which was fought 12, 12 years later, in 1980, when Fiat, as always spearheading the, the boss's front, after a long and careful preparation, which lasted more than one year, in 79, In the summer of 1980, they decided to open uh, a major battle. Threatening to sack about 14,000 workers, which was not just a question of uh, uh, redundancies, but uh, uh, clearly an attempt to break the bone of the working class in the, in the main <coughs> industry in Italy. The workers understood that, and for the last time they rallied to try to, to defend themselves. And it was the, uh, the so-called 35 days of Fiat, <coughs> starting from the beginning of September, the, the biggest, uh, I think it was one of the biggest industry plants in, in whole of Europe at that time was completely blocked, surrounded by pickets everywhere, thousands of workers coming from all Italy, not only Turin, day and night, trying to, uh, uh, trying to, to win this defensive battle, which was a, a life and death question. Yes. And, uh, uh, but this time, the trade union bureaucracy was not prepared to, to follow it to, uh, or to, you know, to adapt to the, to the workers. Yeah. 
Yes, in the first days they did. They organized a city-wide strike and then also proposed a national strike of the metal workers. But it was clearly not, they, they were not, not clearly prepared to go to the end. And the workers knew that. And then when the general secretary of the Communist Party went to the factory gates to hold a big meeting, one worker asked him, if we do occupy the factory, what will the Communist Party do? And the answer was, well, we understand that in the different autonomy of the working class and of the trade union struggle, which the party must not do too much. But if in the end you will decide, we will support you. And the mayor of Turin, who was uh, elected by the Communist Party, also said that if, if Fiat does not uh, step back, we will have a Christmas uh, vigil inside the factory, and say we will occupy the factory. But, uh, uh, and so it was up to the trade union bureaucracy, the only force who could stop this movement. And so when after more than one month of struggle, Fiat tried to organize a, a counter demonstration, calling uh, the, 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 the factory hierarchy, the, 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 the cadres, the uh, white collars, the uh, how do you say, the foremen, uh, you know, those who are loyal to the company. They organized a meeting in a theater under the, the, the slogan, uh, the right to work, we want to go back to work. And, uh, and then they had a demonstration in Turin. There were, uh, who knows, a few thousand, three thousand, five thousand, who knows. But it was like, a, a, you know, like a bell calling for all the reactionary forces. And all the, all, not all the reactionary forces, all the ruling class, including the trade union bureaucracy. So on... Uh, in the morning, there were a few thousand. In the evening, uh, uh, news uh, on TV, there were 10,000. And the following morning, on the newspaper, there were 40,000. Yeah, that's the that's truth. Which they weren't, of course. And that night, the trade union bureaucracy signed the agreement with Fiat. They went to the, to the shop stewards, to the council of Mirafiori, the so-called big, to, to, to have a discussion and to have a vote. And they get a unanimous vote against. There were, out of several thousand of workers, present, very few voted for that. And one of the shop stewards who had been sacked the year before, under the, the the accusation of being a terrorist, which he wasn't. He said this, if we accept this, despite the fact that it was uh, painted as a sort of compromise, uh, the company had made uh, uh, formal concessions. But he said, if you accept this, we go back to the 50s, to those years, with no union, with no representation, with no rights. And so after the, uh, the, day, the following day, they had the meetings uh, the, in all the, on, on all the shifts and in all the plants. Nobody never, we never know what the real vote will, was. But there, there is a, a sort of movie, a, 
a short uh, documentary on, on, on one of these meetings. And there is a, uh, the, the trade union bureaucrats uh, explaining the agreement, saying now we vote. Who is in favor? And there is a small group in the center of the of the space there, mainly the the, the white collar unions, uh, the white white collar workers, and so on, voting in favor. And then he says, uh, "Who is against?" And there is a, a you know a big number of uh, hands of clenched fists raising all all, all around. I say, okay, that's approved by a big majority. That's it. And it, it, maybe it seems uh, funny if, like, how, well, if they were in the majority, why didn't they over, overthrew the, that vote? But the point is, but the point is that they were not able and could not do that. Because after more than one month, what they saw that there was not a formal democratic vote, but they were, have been abandoned by everyone. And betrayed by their own organization. So that was the, the real end of the hot autumn, 12, 12 years later. Although there were other movements, the, the real last war maybe was in 1984, we might say. That's another story, no, I have no time. <laughs> but uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, what happened in Fiat in 1980 then set the tune for all the other factories in the countries. And after that, the trade union bureaucracy began to feel free. The pressure from below was fading. And uh, so they, they, they were able to separate more and more from the working class and to do their own policies without having to recon with, the, with, the, with the, this pressure from below. But to sum up, because I think that I'm at the end of my time, I think that the, 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 the richness of the lesson we can draw from these events, because uh, uh, it was a, a, a movement and a decade, if you like, where all the different, all the main problems of strategy, of tactics, of how, to, how the working class moves uh, on the trade union and electoral struggle, all these were uh, expressed and were, had to be answered in the most concrete and uh, immediate uh, form. And to those who say that it was just uh, a movement uh, for reforms, which were one, as I said, but to those who said, well, it was just, you know, we had a good constitution, but it was outside the factory. Now there is democracy. It was, was fight for reforms. That's the point of view of the bureaucracy. Our answer is that it was not a, a fight for reform. It was a, a fight for change society. And uh, the, reform, the reforms they claimed they have won were not won by them, but w they were just a byproduct of this revolutionary movement. And the fact that uh, out of this, this movement there was this enormous political radicalization, both inside the Communist Party and on the left of the Communist Party too, and in the unions. is also a testimony of the revolutionary character of these events. But the point is that uh, these young, uh, generous and militant and courageous fighters in the, in the revolutionary left,
had had a, a, a fatal uh, weakness in their uh, in their uh, actions because the ideological and theoretical link with the history of the working class in Italy, but particularly with the history of the international workers' movement of the Russian Revolution of Lenin was actually blocked by the by the by the role of Stalinism. Yesterday we spoke about the unbroken thread. They didn't have that thread. Because uh, on one hand, the Communist Party bureaucracy, the, the Stalinists and their followers, had completely uh, cancelled and distorted and um, prostituted the lessons of the Russian Revolution and, and of the forced first four uh, congresses of the international communists and so on, the communist internationals. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, when th they tried to find some alternative point of reference, what they had. <coughs> Maoism, or the guerrillaism, Cuba and Vietnam, uh, in the first period, but that didn't last very long, these horrible uh, theoreticians of the Frankfurt School of Marxist, so-called Marxist philosophy, which is shit. I mean, Herbert Marcuse and those people. <laughs> but that, was, that, that lasted a very short space of time because the working class then came into the fore. And so they had no arsenal, no theoretical arsenal to understand what was going on. And, uh, and the, the so-called Trotskyist organization, which did exist, were completely unable to give this, uh, this, uh, these instruments. These people had been connecting, and I finish, in the, in the year previous to the, to the hot autumn with a certain layer of the rank and file in the Communist Party left. But precisely because of their opportunism, you know, adapting themselves to the so-called deep entryism in the Communist Party, and all the other mistakes that they made, they lost everything, and they lost the, their best elements precisely on the eve of the movement, one month before, a few months before. And so it was inevitable on this basis that this organization, this so-called revolutionary left, made all the possible mistakes. not understanding the role of the union, the role of the shop stewards, the role played by the Communist Party, the way the working class moves, and many other things. <coughs> and therefore, it, it is uh, up to our organization to, to rediscover the real lessons of these events And to retie the, 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 the knot of history, if you like, to, to retie this thread which must link us to our uh, past. And which is embodied uh, precisely in a theoretical arsenal we have. Which is not a handbook. But it is precisely an attempt, a, 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 a lively attempt to, uh, uh, to how do you say, to, to distillato. <laughs> okay, the distilled essence of all this experience of the working class uh, on a world scale. When we began to 
Fred and other comms began to build the, the Italian section in the 80s, there was a complete break with that generation, Fred can tell. It was impossible, it was impossible to build any revolutionary activity with people who have suffered that, that defeat. And it's only by the building of the organization, by the growing of the organization, and by, the, uh, by crossing our roads with the new movements which are preparing, we, which, uh, the way we can really vindicate and, uh, uh, and, and pay our uh, tribute to that, to that movement and to the people who led it. And I hope that this discussion will have also useful elements for uh, other comrades in other sections. Thank you.